People love to say the Bible is full of errors and contradictions, but the truth is most of them can be pretty easily resolved with a little common sense, honest investigation of the scripture, and the application of a simple method we're about to talk about. So, let's do this. Let's tackle the alleged errors issue. We'll do that by using a method I like to call a simple C. S. Spelling. That's right. Many of the so-called errors in the manuscript are simple variants in letters. Say you have one manuscript that was translated from Greek into Old English and another into American English. Well, the English Cheerio. translators might write down theater with the R-E ending, and the American Howdy, team boy. might write down theater with the E-R ending. Now, that's no error, my fellow thespians. It's a variant in spelling, so that's that for that one. On to the M. M is for mistranslation. This is when the original word might not have been translated to the new language perfectly or something along those lines. you got to realize that sometimes there's not a perfect word equivalent at the time of translation or that the translator simply had a slip of the pen or used a word that perhaps could be translated in different ways. Context and comparison solves this lickety split. For instance, Leviticus 11, 13 through 19 says, And these you should regard as an abomination among birds. The eagle, the vulture, buzzard, and bat. Folks go nuts on this one. Bats aren't birds! Bats aren't birds! The Bible is wrong and can't be trusted! Come on. First of all, they didn't have the same animal classifications back then, and the original Hebrew word translated bird here is auf, or however you pronounce that. And although correctly translated bird in many places, it also has a broad meaning like having wings or winged creature, which would, of course, include bats. This is all settled pretty easily with a little looking and thinking, I'd say. Moving on to P for perspective. Sometimes, the testimony of two people can seem contradictory, but when you pay close attention, it might not be that way at all. Quick example. Say there was a car parked in the middle of the street. There's a person on the right of the car and a person on the left. The person on the right says the car door is blue and there's a baby in the back, and the person on the other side says the car door is white and there are two babies. Now, oh, how can this be? These ferocious liars can't be trusted. Now, wait a second there, Jimmy Conclusion Jumper. Fact is, the car could be painted white on one side and blue on the other, and if there are two babies, then there is one, right? So both are actually illuminating the fullness of the scene. Remember, the guy on the right didn't say there was only one baby, he just mentioned one. You gotta pay attention to the language and perspective, people. Sometimes the whole truth is in the details, you follow? L. Literal versus figurative. It's pretty clear that the Bible contains different writing styles like poetry and narrative and uses different parts of speech like similes, metaphors, and analogies, pretty much like we still do today. So if we really want to interpret correctly, it's our job to realize and understand the difference. How, you ask? Great question. By looking at the immediate context using our noggin and comparing it with the rest of Scripture. That way we understand when Jesus says in John 10, 7 that he is the door, he doesn't mean he's a wooden rectangle that swings on hinges. Need I say more? Finally, C for context. This is the biggie, folks. I'd say most alleged error issues arise when people don't acknowledge the proper context of the verse, they quote only part of it or purposefully misuse it. They might say John 3.16 says, For God so loved, but they say Deuteronomy 16.22 says, The Lord your God hates. Now which is it? Does he love or does he hate? Well, you know, this is silly, because the context of John 3.16 is about God's love for people, and the Dute verse is talking about his hate for pillars. You know, if you hack, twist, and misquote everything, you can pretty much make it say whatever you want, and that's not really searching for truth. So, there you have it. With a little effort, honest investigation, and application of the simple C method, the idea that the authority or inerrancy of the Bible is in any way diminished due to errors has been debunked. Adios.